Experiment 18. Spectrometric analysis, concentration of a solution using Beer's law. When white light passes through a prism, it is broken into a spectrum of colors ranging from 400 nanometers, which is violet light, to 800 nanometers, which is red. We see this color with our eye. And this is referred to as the visual spectrum. When light passes through a sample of some uniform thickness, typically on instruments about a centimeter in, in width, part of the light is absorbed and part of the light is transmitted. That part of the light okay, that goes through the samples will be have some of that absorbed by the sample, and the rest of the light will be transmitted. Now, for that light to be absorbed by that sample, it has to be the right frequency or wavelength for it to be absorbed. It can't just be anyone. It's got to be a particular one for that particular species. Basically, we can detect the amount of light absorbed by a sample by monitoring the amount of light before and after the sample. So we can measure the intensity of the light before the sample, and then we measure the intensity of the light after, and then we know that sample would have absorbed the, the difference in that light. The amount of light absorbed is proportional to the concentration of the sample at the proper wavelength, a particular wavelength for a particular sample. So in other words, what we're saying is absorbance is proportional to concentration. Absorbance has no units, it is unitless. So the more substance that is there, the more light that can be absorbed. So the more probability of the light hitting the species doing the absorbing. So the more concentrated this sample is, the more light that's going to be absorbed and the less light that's going to be transmitted. So in other words, we can determine then, as the concentration increases, the absorbance will increase. So we can monitor the concentration of species by monitoring that absorbance. There's a linear relationship between concentration and absorbance. Your eyes are not sensitive enough to detect small changes in color, but instruments are. We can determine the concentration based on a comparison of some standards that you know the concentration absorb. So you can do some standards, measure the concentration, have some concentrations, and measure the absorbance, and then do a plot. And then you have this relationship between concentration and absorbance to unknown, and then you can figure out where that concentration is of the unknown. Many setups are very similar to the one that I'm going to show you right here. Basically, we have some light source. Okay, that's given all the different wavelengths of light. That goes through something called a monochromator. That monochromator basically narrows down the length, of the, the, the wavelength to one wavelength, a single wavelength of light. Then we can measure that intensity of that light before it goes to the sample. Then that sample, and realize it's only that area of sample, that cross section that the light is going through that's absorbing that light. It's not the entire sample, it's just that area that it's going through. Then we measure the intensity of light after. Then we have go, that goes to detector, then a signal processes, and then a reader and basically reads out the absorbance. There's a relationship for that absorbance between that intensity of that monochromator light and that intensity of that transmitted light uh, based on the equation of A is equal to log of IM divided by IT. Species will absorb a maximum of light at a particular wavelength, not absorb at all the different wavelengths. That's why we have a monochromator to narrow it down to a particular wavelength that that particular species we're measuring will absorb that light. We can rearrange this relationship into a more usable equation. Absorbance is dependent on the concentration of the solution and also on the quantity of and also on the quantity of the solution, meaning that sample size. So we can write this relationship as follows. A is equal to epsilon B C, where epsilon is the molar absorptivity of a particular species. It's constant on that species. B is the cell thickness that typically is about one centimeter on that cell uh, cubet as we use it in this experiment. 
C is the concentration of species, A is absorbance, and it's a unitless uh, quantity. This equation, A is equal to epsilon BC, is referred to as Beer's Law. The thing to realize in this equation, which is important to us, is that absorbance and concentration are linear. There's a linear relationship between the two. So if you double the concentration, then the absorbance should double. If you triple the concentration, then the absorbance should triple. We're not going to be concerned about the actual Beer's Law equation. We're more concerned about the relationship between concentration and absorbance, and we're going to use that to determine the concentration of our unknowns. Since there's a linear relationship, we can make something called a calibration plot of your absorbance versus concentration for known standards. So we can take some known concentrations, measure the absorbances, and make a calibration plot. <clears throat> Notice in this plot that I have my axis labeled. I have my absorbance on my y-axis. I have my concentration in milligrams per milliliter of cobalt nitrate. And I have a title which is my calibration plot of cobalt-2 nitrate. These are things I expect for you to have on your plot when you do yours as well. Uh, you would take your standards versus your absorbance, okay, plot those points. Also realize there is a zero, zero point, okay, there's zero absorbance at zero concentration. However, that is not a point that I forced the line to go through, just like we talked before in the previous experiment. It is a point, one data point, but you don't force it to go through. You still draw your best line as you can, as close to all the lines as possible. A straight line, okay, using a ruler. Once you have your calibra calibration plot, then you can do your unknown. You measure your unknown and get the absorbance. Once you get the absorbance, you can just go on the plot say the absorbance was 0.4 you measured, you go across till you hit the, the calibration line, then come down and measure the concentration. Okay, now you gotta realize that concentration is that of a diluted sample. So if you want the bulk concentration, you're gonna have to go ahead and do another calculation we'll talk about more as we go in this um, lecture. Now this is one way to do it where I just read it off the plot. Another way to do it is there's an equation of the line for that line. Okay, there's an equation. You may recall, okay, y is equal to mx plus b, where b is your y-intercept. That's where it crosses the y and y-axis. m is your slope. x, in this case, is your concentration. y is your absorbance. So you could take that equation now convert it into this particular example, which is absorbance, is equal to your slope times your concentration plus your y-intercept. Okay, so you're looking at this equation right here. Absorbance is equal to slope times concentration plus y-intercept. We could plug in our point 4 as our absorbance, plug in our y-intercept and our slope, which we're getting from our plot. Okay, if you use Excel and do this plot by Excel, which we will do in this case, uh, you can get your slope and your y-intercept, plug that in and solve for it. You also could do it by hand. You can take this plot right here, this line, determine the slope of that line, your y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1, and your y-intercept, where it intercepts on that y-axis, and calculate it by uh, using your hand plot as well, using the equation of the line. But then you will take your unknown, rearrange the equation, which means you get absorbance minus y-intercept divided by slope is equal to concentration, which in this example will be 0.4 minus 0.0274 minus 0.015, which is 24.8 milligrams per milliliter. Now recall, when we talked about slopes, um, talked about graphs to make sure that it's a graph over the whole page as much as you can, about three-fourths. We also talked about how to decide to do your axis, etc. Make sure that you know that zero, 00 is a point, but it's not forced through zero, 00. Label your axis, your y, your x, and also title your plot. Uh, you can figure out the unknown concentration either by drawing your line on your graph and solving for it, or doing your equation of a line on that line, figuring out the slope and the y-intercept and calculating it. But you will do it on a hand plot as well as you will do it using Excel, and you're going to have to give me that value as well.
Okay, for this experiment, you just need 50 milliliters of 0.2 molarity of cobalt nitrate. Okay, you need that, then you're going to make your standards from that. So how we will do that, we'll take first 0 milliliters of your standard and 10 milliliters of water, minimum. in other words, pure water, which is your blank, which is going to be 0 molarity, um, and 0 milligrams per milliliter. Um, then you're going to take 1 milliliter of your 0.2 and 9 milliliters of water, so you're diluting that 0.2, which will get you a 0.02 molarity, and I'll talk in a second about how to calculate that. Then you take 3 mils of 0.2, 7 mils of water, um, then 5 mils and 5, 7 and 3, 9 and 1, and then pure 0.2, which gives you 0.2 molarity of cobalt nitrate since we added no water. Notice that the, the volumes between your cobalt nitrate and your water all add up to 10. Okay, that's all a total volume of 10. So the first thing, say, how can we calculate molarity? How do you get these values? Because you still got to calculate the concentration of the 3 mil, the 5 mil, the 7 mil, and the 9 mil. So how are we going to do that calculation? Well, it's just a CV equals CV. You have your bulk concentration and volume equal to your diluted concentration and volume. Um, the concentration of the bulk we know is 0.2. The volume of the bulk is changing. It's 1, 3, 5, 7, and 9. The concentration of the diluted is what we're looking for. Okay, we're looking for that. And the total volume each time is going to be 10 mils. Okay, because we set up the experiment that way. So then you plug your values in. So for instance, for the one mil sample, we know it's 0.2 molarity of cobalt nitrate. We take in one mil of that, of that bulk, is equal to the concentration of our diluted, and the total volume is 10 milliliters. So you divide through by your 10, and you end up getting 0 0.0200 molarity of cobalt nitrate, which is already written in my table up at the top. Notice that my milliliters cancel, leaving me in molarity. So, if you want to do the 3 milliliter one, it would be exact same calculation, except that instead of having 1 mil milliliter, this will now be 3 milliliters. It's still going to be a total of 10 milliliter solution. Do your calculation and get your value. Then the same thing with 5, 7, and 9. Now, that gives you your molarity, but we're not going to plot molarity. We're going to plot milligrams per milliliter of cobalt nitrate. So we got to go convert from molarity to milligrams per milliliter. So let's talk about how we're going to do that. So if we talk about that same one milliliter uh, of 0.2, diluting it with nine milliliters of water, which is 0.02 molarity, I need to convert that into milligrams per milliliter because this is what we're going to plot. Okay, we're plotting that on our x-axis. Okay, so how can I get from molarity to milligrams per milliliter? Well, to convert from moles per liter to milligrams per milliliter, we're going to have to go through molar mass. I got to basically change moles into milligrams, okay, and change liters into milliliters. So that's just going to be a conversion factor between uh, milliliters and liters, and from moles to milligrams through molar mass. So you start off with your 0 0.0200 molarity of cobalt nitrate. Then I'll multiply that by my molar mass. Okay, that's my molar mass. So therefore my moles cancel. So now I'm in grams per liter. Now I gotta get that to milligrams. So then I'll multiply a thousand milligrams for every one gram. So then my grams cancel. So now I'm in milligrams, and I need that divided by milliliters, so I'll have to do another conversion factor between milliliters and liters, which then gets my liters canceling with liters and leaving me in milliliters, which gives me my final answer of 3.66 milligrams per milliliter of cobalt nitrate, which is what we record. So you're going to have to do this calculation for each of the ones that we showed you in the other previous uh, table on the previous slide. Now, you can see a, a, a multiply by a thousand divided by a thousand. That's something I would want to do. There's another way I would do this. As I remember, I talked to you before about the milli thing. If I say, um, if I say milli 
uh, grams. Uh, basically, this milli is just a prefix. It's a power of 10. Okay, the gram is the unit. So I can make this calculation a little bit simpler by doing the following. Instead of talking about 0 0.0200 moles per liter, if I do the same thing to the numerator as I do to the denominator, I haven't changed anything. So I'm going to call this millimoles per milliliter. Haven't changed it. Numerically, same values, just a ratio of those thousands in the numerator and the denominator. Haven't changed a thing. Okay, I can do that. Then I'll take the molar mass. Instead of doing it grams per mole, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to talk in terms of milligrams per millimole. Once again, I haven't changed the ratio because I did the same thing to the numerator and denominator. And you notice what happens here is my millimoles cancel, and I'm left in milligrams per millimole, which gets me the same answer that we had before. So in other words, I can take that molarity in terms of millimoles per milliliter, multiply it times my molar mass in terms of milligrams per millimole, and I get milligrams per milliliter. You can do it either way, just make sure you do it correctly. <clears throat> for the unknown, you need 10 milliliters for a group for the unknown, okay? We're changing the unknown instructions from the manual. Okay, page 124, the last paragraph, is where we're going to make some changes. The unknown will be made by diluting 5 milliliters of unknown with 5 milliliters of deionized water. This should give us the correct absorbance that has a reading that's less than that of the pure 0.2 molarity cobalt nitrate. If it doesn't happen, then you're going to have to do it again and try to use less of the cobalt nitrate and get it within that range. You want to do your unknown and make sure the absorbance is less than that of that pure 0.2 molarity cobalt nitrate. If it's not, then you have to change to a different ratio of unknown to water. Okay, Five and five should work most of the time. But if it's over, then you might want to try four or three or something. You want to get it below that. I explain why I need it below it later on in one of the slides. Uh, another change is they want you to use volumetric flask to make the unknown. Well, we didn't use that for the standards, so there's no reason to do it here. You can only be as accurate as your least accurate measuring device. So if we didn't do that in the standard, then there's no reason to do it on the unknown. So you can use the same way you did your uh, standards. Use graduated cylinders, etc. <clears throat> Determine the diluted concentration of the unknown directly off the hand plot. Or you could do the calculation. You can use the equation as well if you want. Figure out the slope, y-intercept. You can do that on your hand plot, but you have to do a hand plot. Okay, so you have to do a hand plot, as well as I expect you to do one with a computer. Use Excel, make a computer, and use the equation or line for that one. Okay, I want the equation or line on the computer plot. Also make sure that equation or line shows up on the plot. Okay, I want to see that equation in a lot. Now, I forgot to mention on that plot where you have, I showed you the equation line, there's this R factor that was under it, R squared. That's, that tells you how good your equation, your um, equation of line is. The closer you are the one, the better fit your data is. So your goal is to get something in the 0 0.9, 0 0.95 range. If you're in 0.6 or something, that's selling you that you don't have very good data. So you go when you're doing it, the closer your R square is to 1, the better your data is in the sense of linearity. Other thing that the instructions tell you is that you need to have an absorbance that's less than 1. Okay, and that's not needed. You don't have to worry about that. You just need it to be linear, and you need your unknown to be less than that pure 0.2 molarity solution, the absorbance of that 0.2. As I said, I'll explain that in a, in a couple of minutes. All right, here's an example of a Beer's Law plot where I have the standards and I have the um, plotted out on the plot. Notice I have my title, I have my axis, I have a Y equation. And here's that R square equation I was talking about. This is 0.9935. That tells me it's a very good straight line. You can see that all the points almost touching the lines. So that's a very good uh, Beer's Law plot. Now, now if I wanted to do my calculation for my unknown, we got to realize when I read my absorbance on the plot, 
say I say I have an absorbance of 0.4 and I read that that absorbance is for my diluted sample even if I use the R I mean the uh, Y equation I'm still getting that for the diluted sample even if I use this equation for Y I'm still getting my diluted sample you need to report to me the bulk sample okay we had to dilute that sample to get it into there remember we took five mils of the unknown and five mils of the of water so I need to somehow get from the diluted sample to my actual bulk sample so how do I do that okay so these are both diluted concentrations I need to get to that well I gotta do a CV equals CV I got my bulk concentration time my volume bulk equal to my concentration my diluted times my volume volume of my diluted <clears throat> so uh, we need to plug in those values and, and calculate it let's think about the, what has happened though before we do that we took a unknown bulk we took five mils of that unknown bulk we then diluted it with five milliliters of water Okay, which gives us a total of 10 milliliters of solution. Then we took some of that, put it in a cuvette, and went to the machine. Then we went to the spec 20, okay, and we got the absorbance, and we plotted that on our plot. So once we got this value, we got the absorbance, we went to the plot, and we got some value on our plot of our diluted sample. So the concentration that we got on this plot okay whatever that concentration is we got on the plot is the concentration of that sample that was in the cuvette now we didn't change that sample from when it was taken from that five and five so the concentration we got on the plot is the same concentration for the cuvette as well as the concentration of that five and five now that's not what we're looking for we're looking for the bulk so now we know that I have some concentration of that 10 milliliters and I'm trying to figure out the concentration of that bulk so now I can figure out what to plug into my equation okay we took five mils of bulk we got some concentration from the plot or the equation and the total amount was 10 milliliters five and five basically the calculation for um, calculating your unknown looks like this uh, you got five mils of your bulk time the concentration of your bulk equal to the concentration of your diluted from your plot time your concentration of your volume of 10 milliliters so if you had to re-dilute your solution because it wasn't within that range of less than that 0.2 molarity cobalt nitrate solution then you won't be using five you'd be using some other number you can see from this calculation that what's going to happen is, since I got 5 and 10, it's going to end up being the concentration of the bulk being double what you get off the graph. Now, don't just go double the, the amount because that's only working in this situation because it's 5 and 10. And what if it's a different problem when it's not 5 and 10? What if it's 3 and 7, you know, or something like that, or 3 and 8? You need to be able to do the calculation. Okay, so you got to make sure you understand the calculations to so do the calculations and show it. Don't just double it. Let's show you our actual calculation. This is how it's going to be on a test or a quiz or something. It's going to be in a word problem, so you got to be able to figure out from the word problem how to pull the numbers and do the calculation. I have a 15 milliliter solution of unknown concentration is diluted to 250 milliliters. 10 milliliter aliquot, meaning a portion of that 250 milliliters is analyzed with a spectrometer and the concentration of this solution is found to be 3.50 times 10 to negative second milligrams per milliliter. In other words, that's what you got from the plot. Okay, what is the original concentration of your original solution? So, let's start this by drawing a picture. Okay, I got some unknown bulk. According to this, we took 15 milliliters of that unknown and we diluted that to 250 milliliters. Okay, so we got 15 milliliters, then we diluted to 250. Then we took part of that, 10 milliliters of it, put it into a cuvette, went to the spec 20, 
And from the spec 20, we got all the absorbance, then we went to our plot and we figured out it's 3.5 times 10 to the negative second milligrams per milliliter. Now, that is the concentration of that cuvette. Okay, that's the concentration of all that sample that was that 10 milliliter, milliliter aliquot. Where did that come from? That came from that 250 milliliters. So this is still the concentration of that 250 milliliters of solution. Okay, it doesn't matter. It was 10 milliliter, milliliter aliquot. It could have been a five. Could have been a six. Could have been anything. It didn't matter. Remember, it's only that portion of the sample that the light's going through that it's seeing. So it doesn't matter how big the sample is, as long as light's going through that sample. Uh, so that gives me the concentration of that 250 milliliter solution. Okay. So when I'm using my C V equals C V, what's going to be the total volume of my diluted? It's going to be my 250. Volume of your bulk is going to be that amount that came from the unknown. And the concentration of the bulk is your original. Okay. Um, concentration of that bulk is what we're looking for. Okay, so concentration's coming from that diluted amount that we got from the plot. So in this case, you got concentration of your bulk times the 15 milliliter bulk equal to 3.50 times 10 to the negative second milligrams per milliliter, um, which came from your plot, times your 250 milliliters of solution. Do your calculation, rearranging it, we'll get 0.583 milligrams per milliliter. Notice that your units cancel for milliliters, leaving us in our milligrams per milliliter. Now I mentioned that I'll tell you why uh, we have to dilute the sample, and that's what we're going to do right now. So why do we have to dilute the unknown to make sure that the absorbance is below the highest absorbance reading of the standards? Well, we've got to realize when we're doing our plot, okay, our absorbance versus con concentration, okay, it's linear. Okay, we said its absorbance is proportional to concentration is there's some linear effect. Okay, however, it's not linear for infinity. Somewhere it's going to eventually turn and kind of level out and go uh, in the sense that it's not linear anymore. We need to make sure that we stay in the linear range. So when we did our experiment, we have our linear range, and we know that it's linear in this range. If you have an unknown sample, and it's somewhere over here, we don't know where this line goes. Okay, where's that line? So if that's not, if that's outside your data points, your standard curve, then you have no idea where the concentration is. So we got to get that unknown concentration back in the window of our linear range that we measure. So that's why we got to dilute our sample, and then we can figure out our concentration. If we're outside that standard range, then we got to extrapolate back, and you're not sure if you're in the linear range or not. So we have to make sure that we're in the linear range. Okay, other changes in the experiment. Okay, the section where we say plot in the spectrum of cobalt nitrate, we will not do this section. We will use a lambda max of 626. So that's what we're going to put on our spec 20, 626 nanometers for the Beer's Law plot section and the, for our standards as well as our unknown. Now, one thing that you can check as you're doing the experiment is that since we're using one milliliter of the cobalt nitrate, the 0.2, and then three milliliters of the 0.2 molarity, molarity of cobalt nitrate. What should be happening, if things are working right for you, is the one milliliter versus three milliliter, the, the absorbance should triple. Okay, and the one milliliter to the five milliliters, the absorbance should be five times, okay, because it's a linear relationship. If it's not happening, you, we, need, we need to look at it and see if something's wrong. Important points, be sure to use the same spec 20 for the entire experiment. Don't do the standards on one and the unknown and the other. You gotta do everything at one time. Okay, do everything at one time on one instrument. Make sure you record the serial number of the instrument you're using. Don't have any problems with anything that's recorded in your notebook. You're gonna do a hand plot in your notebook and also a computer plot where you're gonna staple the computer plot from Excel to the uh, lab report. 
the hand plot, you can do it by drawing the line to figure out your um, concentration, or you can do it by the equation of the line, figuring out your slope and your y-intercept. The computer plot, I expect you to use the equation of the line. Okay, make sure that's showing up on your plot as well. I want to see that equation as well as the r square factor on your uh, computer plot. Make sure you have an axis label. Make sure you have a title. Make sure you're using the big majority of the, plot, um, of the paper when you're doing your graph, etc. Report the concentration of your bulk unknown in milligrams per milliliter of cobalt nitrate by both the hand plot and the computer plot using the equation real line. Right, I want the bulk unknown. I don't care about the diluted value. I want the bulk. That's your final conclusion is in there. Should be the bulk concentration in milligrams per milliliter with both the hand plot and the computer plot. I want to see both numbers. Now I suggest when you're doing this experiment to make all your standards and unknown first, put them in beakers and label them, then go to your table uh, with the spec 20 and then do the experiment at one time. Now realize that the spec 20, when you use a special cuvette in there, usually it has a line on the front of it, there's no rim on it, so do not use test tubes, it's a cuvette. You must use the cuvette, otherwise the light won't refract correctly through the tube. Uh, you'd be given two of them by uh, the stock clerk. Make sure you clean them good. Do not handle them at the bottom. Handle them at the top. Wipe them with chem wipes. That, that, that's the white tissue paper. Make sure you place them in the, 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 um, the unit the same way each time with that light white line pointing out, okay, facing out um, um, the same way each time. Uh, you're going to pour in your sample into one of your cuvettes, then measure it, then pour it out, and pour the next sample in the next cuvette, in the same cuvette. You can use one cuvette for your, your blank. Okay, that's the one that has no cobalt nitrate. You would fill that one up with just your blank water and use that to test your, um, your zero between each run. Okay, some hints on the spec 20. First, you should let the instrument warm up about 15 minutes before you use it. Uh, you should select the filter by switching the level on the left side to 600 to 950 nanometers. We're using uh, 626, so you need that filter to be correctly. So make sure you get the right filter for um, your um, wavelength. Select a wavelength of 626 nanometers with the top up, knob on the top. Okay. Also put it on transmittance mode. With no sample and the sample door closed, Turn your left knob, the one that says 0% T, until you get a reading of zero. Basically, you're saying there's no light getting through and you're measuring zero absorbency. Okay. Then you fill your cuvette with deionized water to the middle of the white mark on the tube. Wipe the cuvette. Place the cuvette in the sample holder with the mark facing out towards you. Close the door. Put the spec 20 in absorbance mode now. Okay, so now you get into absorbance mode. Turn the right knob until it reads zero absorbance. Okay, basically you're saying 100% transmitting this light. All the light's going through. So you calibrate the instrument. You said zero light and you said all the light. Then shake your samples very well. And then you fill up one of the cuvettes with your standard or unknown. Place it in the spec 20 and record the absorbance. Remember, you're only given two cuvettes. One you keep your blank in, and the other one you keep changing your samples, the S1s, and also your unknowns. Make sure that you add the solution up to somewhere around that white line. That way you get enough a solution for the light to go through. Wipe it with a chem wipe, handle them from the top, not the bottom. You should check your zero with your blank in between runs. Okay, so once you do a standard, you should go back to the blank and make sure it's saying zero absorbance. Okay, and you can do another standard and then go back to zero and readjust as needed. 